Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about major types of sources that you might run into when you're doing your research. And the first one that we're going to talk about are books. Now I know that everybody knows what a book is. The librarian definition is that it should be at least 50 pages and that could be printed or electronic. It could be part of a single volume work or it could be part of a multi-volume work like an encyclopedia. It could also be an audio recording. Now, there are two reasons why we bring it up. The first is because it's really good for introductory in information. It doesn't assume prior knowledge like scholarly journals do. And that's important, especially if you're just getting started on a subject and you don't have a lot of grounding in the subject. This could be a really good way to get some of that information. On the other hand, because books are so large, they're good for comprehensive or in-depth information. Articles tend to focus on one very, very tiny aspect of a subject. A book has a lot more space to talk about something and go into finer detail. Now, the biggest problem with books is that they can be outdated, particularly for technological information. This is obviously not going to be as much of an issue if you're looking at an electronic book because they're going to be updated all the time. Now we'll turn our attention to popular magazines. If you've ever been in a doctor's office waiting room, you've probably seen one. So popular magazines provide information on a wide range of general interest, and they may or may not provide well-researched information. They contain ads, more than even just containing ads, that's their primary focus. Their goal is to make money. If they happen to inform, that's great. Obviously, they want to be entertaining because they want you to come back, but their primary responsibility is to their advertisers. So I don't know if you've ever seen, noticed this before, but sometimes you might see Let's say you're looking at a magazine and on one page you see um, an article discussing how to apply mascara. And then on the opposite side, you see an ad for mascara. That's not an accident. The advertisers of the company making the makeup went to the magazine and said, hey, why don't you write an article about this? So the article is intended to get you to buy it. Now, that's not such a big deal if we're talking about a product like um, mascara, but what if we were talking about a pharmaceutical company who was writing an article about a medicine? Now, they might not necessarily, um, now, while they can't necessarily tell you, now, while they, now, while advertisers can't necessarily tell you that the drug has no issues, there are still laws that are they're required to say they can push them off to the side, they can draw your attention and your focus to something else. And so this is something that you have to be very careful of when you're looking at popular magazines, and it's part of the reason why they're not particularly trustworthy. So some examples might include Sports Illustrated, Vogue, Entertainment Weekly. Next, we're going to look at trade publications. These are designed to inform members of a particular profession. So they're professionals that are speaking directly to one another. And they're usually printed by trade or professional associations. They can be peer reviewed or they may not be. So in terms of trustworthiness, they're somewhere in between popular magazines and scholarly journals, which we're going to take a look at in a second. So some examples, InfoWorld, American Bar Association Journal, NEA Today Magazine, the vast majority of careers will have a trade publication attached to them. Then let's look at newspapers. Newspapers disseminate news stories in a very timely manner, it can be daily or weekly. And they can be super serious or extremely sensational. So they may or may not also be subject specific. So for example, the Wall Street Journal is only looking at finance that's a subject specific newspaper as opposed to the New York Times, which is going to talk about everything uh, having to do with our world today. That's a general newspaper. Some examples, as I mentioned, the New York Times, the National Enquirer, the Merrick Herald Life. Newspapers tend to have two different kinds of stories running at the same time. There's um, quick hitting news, what just happened. So they get a reporter to go out there and, and write a, uh, an article about 
uh, fast breaking news. Now, because it's trying to get there as quickly as possible, the they may not have enough time to fact check everything. So if you'll notice, a lot of times in newspapers, there'll be a retraction page after the article was printed to make any of those corrections. So always be careful when you're looking at something that's late breaking news. On the other hand, they also do long-term investigative stories where these are um, where reporters will take weeks or even months or possibly longer to research an article or, or excuse me to research a particular topic in depth. Now, the last type of resource we're going to look at today are scholarly journals. These are kind of the bread and butter of college. Scholarly journals provide timely information to scholars or to professionals in a variety of fields. They're usually printed by academic institutions or by professional organizations, and they are peer reviewed. And that is really going to increase the quality and the trustworthiness of the articles in the journal. So it's usually a very trustworthy source. I always like to hedge my bets. I never say something is 100% trustworthy because there are always examples of even very well-known journals that have printed things that ended up needing to be retracted. Having said that, it's probably the best and closest to trustworthy information that we can get. I wanted to read this quote to you. It says, while Google is showing you answers, academic discovery tools are reflecting the scholarly conversation around a subject. So a wide range of opinions are to be expected. An article doesn't just live on its own out in the ether. It's actually a conversation between scholars. So they are often know exactly who the other people in their field are that are doing similar research and what those people's viewpoints are. And the <clears throat> and the article that they are writing will often be in response to somebody else's. So some examples of scholarly journals, you might find the Berkeley Journal of Criminal Law, Oxford University's Journal of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences, or the Journal of Literacy Research. Warning. When you are doing research and you click that little box that says that you're looking for scholarly journals, that you're looking for peer-reviewed articles, what you are telling the system is that you want articles that were rented, written in journals that contain peer-reviewed articles. That does not mean that every article within that journal is itself peer-reviewed. For example, scholarly journals will print letters to the editor, they'll print opinion pieces, they'll print conference proceedings, calendar of events, all of those kinds of things are not going to be peer reviewed. So you have to double check that just because you found an article that is in a scholarly journal, you can't always assume it's peer reviewed. So how do we look and see? Well, there's a couple of clues that we can use to try and figure out whether an article is scholarly. So here's an example of an article, and I can see that it was written by an expert in the field, often a professor, and it tells you where they are affiliated. It has an abstract or a summary of the article. The journal is peer-reviewed. I've scrolled further down on the same article. It will often, though not always, report on original research and provide charts and graphs. It will contain jargon that is relevant to the field. They're going to use the vocabulary that is specific to that particular field. I scrolled further down on the same article, and now we can get to their references, which you can see are extensive. If they only have a couple of citations, that's usually a red flag that they haven't done their research well. And they're also, they're long. I hate to say it. I know people are always looking for that quick fix. But in general, scholarly articles should be at the very least 8 to 10 pages and often much more than that. If they're quite short, it's usually a red flag to me. Thank you for joining me.